Today we will study together from Parshas Vayetze, the Parsha of the week. If you have a Chumash in front of you and you'd like to follow along, uh, please open to Perak Chavtes, chapter 29, Pasuk. Well, let's begin. Let's begin with Pasuk Chav, Pasuk 20. The Pasuk says that Yaakov, the Torah is talking, yeah, the Torah is telling us Yaakov has escaped the wrath of his brother Esau after, after having stolen the brachas from their father Yitzchak, after having been informed in no uncertain terms that his brother Esau has, has every intention of killing him in revenge, Yaakov escapes. And he ends up uh, by his mother, Rivka's brother, a man by the name of Lovan, to whom we had already been introduced when the shidduch between Yitzchak and Rivka was made. Initially, previously, two parshas ago in Parshas Chayasora, be, be it as it may, uh, Yaakov escapes the wrath of his brother Esau, and he goes to Lovan. Now Lovan, the Torah says, well, Lovan shtei bonos. Lovan has two daughters. And here the story gets very interesting. Shem Hagdoila Leah, the Shem Hagtana Rochel. Lovan has two daughters. The name of the older daughter is Leah. The name of the younger daughter is Rochel. The Ene Leah Rakois, the Torah tells us Leah's eyes were delicate. Leah's eyes were soft. Leah's eyes were delicate and soft. Rochel Hoysa Yefastoya. Rochel, the younger sister, is the beauty queen. She's Yefastoya, Vifasmara. She's beautiful. And Yaakov is smitten with the younger sister, Rachel. She's just beautiful, and he falls in love with her. And he makes a deal with his uncle, Lavan. And the deal is that he will work seven years in order to get the hand of the younger sister, Rachel, in marriage. And the Pasuk says, Perak Chavtes, Pasuk Chav, Vayavod Yaakov Barachel Sheva Shonim. Yaakov worked for Rachel for seven years, as was agreed upon, between Yaakov and his uncle Lovan, soon to be his father-in-law Lovan. But Yaakov is, is in love with Rochel. He loves her so much that the seven years feel like a couple of days, goes by so quickly. Because he's so dedicated, because he's so focused on, on the end goal of, of Rochel's hand in marriage. After seven years, Pasuk Chav Aleph, Vayomer Yaakov and Lovan, and Yaakov says to his uncle Lovan, Hova is ishti, give me my wife. Kimol uyamai, for my days have completed. We are voyo eleho, it's time for me to get married. Rashi explains that Yaakov already at this point knows that he's destined to have 12 sons, 12 shvatim, and he is a strapping bachelor. He's 84 years old, and he's eager to get going. So he tells Loman, listen, we, have a, we had a deal. I worked for you for seven years for Rochel, and uh, my seven years are up. So... It's time that you, I, I, I worked, I did my time. It's time for you to pony up and give me Rochel's hand in marriage. All right, now here's where things get interesting. By yes, if Lovan, that's called Anshe Hamokim, Lovan gathers together all the, local, all the locals, all the people. By Yas Mishta, and he makes a party because which Jewish event happens without a party? I'm sure there was sushi, right? And a bar. And, uh, you know, I wonder who they called to be Masada Kedushin. They had the, everything was, everything was ready. Vayihivo Erev, that night, Vayikaches Leia Bitoi. And he takes Leia, his daughter, Vayove Oiso Elov, and he brings Leia to Yaakov, Vayovo Yeleho, and Yaakov and Leia get married and live together as husband and wife. Vayitin Lovan Loa Zilpa Shivchosoi, Leleia Bitoi Shivcho, Lovan, the father, gives his daughter Leah a maidservant by the name of Zilpah. Um, all right, if we have time, we'll get into that. And it is in the morning, quote, Vehine hi Leah. And behold, she is Leah. Yaakov discovers in the morning that the woman he's married to is not the woman he loves, not the woman he's worked seven years for, not the woman he had his eye on, not the woman he was smitten by, but her older sister. But he doesn't realize this until the morning. By Hiva Boiker, it is in the morning. 
Behold, she is Leia. By Yoimer Lovan, so he goes to his now father in law, who's now his father in law of one night, and his uncle, and he comes to Lovan and he says, Ma sisali. What have you done to me? I worked for you for Rachel. Why did you cheat me? And Lovan responds, Lovan says, the father-in-law, the uncle says, listen, it doesn't work that way in our, part of the ta- in our part of town. We don't give the younger girls to get married before the older girls. <coughs> the older girls have to get married first. Lovan says, listen, don't make a scene right now. Finish, Sheva Brochus. Then I'll give you Rachel too, no problem. You'll work for me for another seven years. I'll give you Rachel. Then you'll work for another seven years and everything will be fine. And that's in fact what happens. That's what happens at the end of Sheva Brachus with Leah. Yaakov marries Rachel, not before he commits to work for Lovan for another seven years. And so it is, Lovon ends up marrying off both his daughters, Leah and Rochel, to Yaakov. Yaakov take, takes both their hands in marriage. Leah first, seven days later, Rochel. He works for seven years before. He works for seven years after. Seven years before is for Leah. Seven years after is for Rochel. And it's a happy family. All right, this is the story. And you're all, of course, familiar with it. Now, just for today, I want to talk about probably one of the most famous Rashi's, quoted, of course, from the Gemara, in the entire Parsha. This is Rashi in Posuk Chofei, on the words, Vayehi Baboiker, Vehinei Hileya. It was in the morning, Vehinei Hileya, and behold, she's Leia. So what's bothering Rashi here? What does Rashi want? Rashi wants, what do you mean it was, the, the, the words are difficult to understand. Vayahiva Boiker was in the morning, behold, she was Leia. She didn't become Leia in the morning. She was Leia all night. Yaakov didn't know that she was Leia all night. Yaakov thought she was Rachel all, all night, fine. But, she was Le- but the truth is that she was Leia all night. So the wording of the Pasuk, Vayahiva Boiker, Behina Hilei, was in the morning, behold, she is Leia, makes it sound like she had this identity transformation in the morning. Rashi is bothered by this expression. The Torah should have said that it was in the morning and he discovered that she was Leah. He recognized her. He, he, he was surprised to learn. He was surprised to discover. But not Vihina Hileya. So Rashi says, so, so Rashi picks up on this. What kind of an expression in this? What, what kind of expression in this? What, what kind of, somebody, somebody writes in the comments, actually both seven years were working for Rochel. Well, actually you're right. Both sets of seven years, his motive was to work for Rochel, correct. But in the end, the first seven years were, uh, were yeah, anyways, it, it, you're right. His motive in both, with all 14 years was for Rochel. That's correct. Okay. It was in the morning that she is Leia. So Rashi says, Avol balaylo loy hoysoleya. The Torah wants us, the Torah lends itself to be read in such a way where at night she wasn't Leah. What do you mean she wasn't Leah? Who was she if he wasn't Leah? She wasn't Leah. It says, Rashi lefisha mosar Yaakov l'rochel simonim. Yaakov gave Rochel simonim. He gave her ways to identify herself to him. When Rochel realized, when Rochel saw that her father Lovan is going to pull a Lovan move and he's going to send Leia instead of her. Omra Rochel said to herself, My sister is going to be embarrassed. My sister is going to be embarrassed because she's not going to know the simonim, she's not going to know the signs that, that Yaakov and Rochel had prearranged. So Rochel gave Leah the simonim, so that Rochel could pretend, so Rochel gave Leah the simonim, so that Leah could pretend that she was Rochel. And so all night, Yaakov actually thought that she was Rochel because she had all the simonim, she had all the signs. In the morning, it was only in the morning that Yaakov realizes, oh, I was tricked. 
I was tricked and it wasn't Rachel, it was actually Leah. But all night she, she, successfully, she successfully pulled off through these simonim, she successfully pulled off this, this, this scam, pretending that she was Rachel rather than Leah, and that's how it succeeded all night. That's how Rashi explains the, the, the nuance, the wording of the Pasuk, that it was only in the morning that she was Leah, because all night successfully they had pulled off this trick, tricking Yaakov that was in fact, that Yaakov would think that it was Rachel and not Leah. All right, this is the Rashi that I want to talk about now, at least for a couple of minutes. First, let's dissect what it is exactly that Rashi is saying. Okay. What Rashi is saying is that before the wedding, Rachel and Yaakov had a conversation. Again, Rachel and Yaakov are deeply in love. They're planning to get married. Yaakov is working for Rachel for seven years, um, and, and he's racing through the time because he's, because he's so excited. So Rochel and Yaakov have a conversation before the wedding. We don't know exactly how the conversation went, but we know enough to know that Rochel and Yaakov anticipate that their father, Lovon, is going to pull shtick. They know enough to know that Lovon, the, Lovon Ha'arami, Lovon the scammer, Lovon the cheater, is going to pull some kind of shtick and send someone else there rather than Rochel. They want to prepare themselves for this. So Yaakov and Rochel agree upon Simonim, identificational marks, ways of identifying who it is in fact that will be standing under the chuppah together with Rochel, together with Yaakov. Who, who it is that will be standing there? And Yaakov says, Rochel, the simon is that, uh, you know, right when the rabbi is about, I, I don't know what exactly the Simonim were, but right when the rabbi will be about to make the third bracha, you'll give a cough. And right after he makes the sixth bracha, you'll give a sneeze. And, and when you're walking around seven times, you know, you'll say, uh, you know, you'll say, Lam I don't know, some kind of sign that nobody else should realize. But Rochel and Yaakov would know, would, had these simonim, they had these signs between themselves, these hints, so that Yaakov wouldn't be cheated by Lovan and end up with somebody else. Yaakov gives these simonim to Rochel. And Rachel accepts them. We don't, it doesn't say that Rachel argued. Rachel accepts. In other words, Rachel understands that her father could pull shtick. Rachel understands that her father could, could, could do something to make tzaras. So Rachel goes along with it. Okay. Rachel goes along with it, and they both agree. This means, again, this means, Yaakov is anticipating that Lovan's going to make tzaras. Lovan's going to make problems. Rochel is anticipating that Lovan is going to make problems. They both agree. They both agree on simonim of how they're going to identify each other, presumably, presumably because Yaakov doesn't want to be tricked and Rochel doesn't want to be tricked. And Rochel doesn't want Yaakov to be tricked and Yaakov doesn't want Rochel to be tricked. So they develop a system between themselves where they're both protected. Yes? Okay. All right. Now Lovan throws a huge party because which kind of doesn't like to make a party? So Lovan throws a huge party. He throws a party. He gathers all the people together, right? The Pesach says, call on Shiamokim, all the locals, he makes a party. And Rachel sees that exactly as she and Yaakov had anticipated, sure enough, Lovan is doing what Lovans do. And he takes Leah to the chuppah. So Rachel says to herself, we got a problem. What's the problem? Leah doesn't know the signs. And Leah is going to be identified by Yaakov as the wrong woman. And Yaakov is going to reject her. And Leah is going to get embarrassed. Can't have it. my sister get embarrassed. So Rachel gives the signs to her older sister, Leah. Leah gets married, pretending she's her younger sister. Yaakov is fooled because the simonim that he gave Rochel are now being displayed to her by Leah. So exactly as they agreed upon, as Leah walks around, she coughs at the right time. She sneezes at the right time. She says the right capital to him at the right time. Everything. So Yaakov is fooled by all of this, and it's only the next morning that Yaakov discovers that he's been duped and he's been worked and he's been scammed. 
because Rochel gave the simonim to Leah. The old younger sister gave the simonim to her older sister. All right? This is what Rashi says. Now the Rashi makes our head spin. The Rashi makes our head spin. Let's ask some of the most obvious questions here. Number one, why is Yaakov the next morning upset with Lavan for deceiving him? This is, this is, <laughs> this is hair-raisingly difficult to understand. Why is Yaakov coming to Lavan the next morning with a complaint, Lama Rimi Sonny, why, why did you deceive me? He anticipated that Lavan was going to deceive him. He knew that Lavan was going to deceive him. He had prepared himself for, dece- for being deceived by Lavan. It's not Lavan he should be upset with. It's Rachel. Who's the one that let him down here? Lavan. Lavan did, Lavan did exactly what Yaakov knew he was going to do. Lavan did what everybody knew Lavan was going to do. Lavan was Lavan. Imagine you do a business deal with a Ganef. Right? You do a business deal with a Ganef and you go to an attorney and you say to an attorney, listen, I need you to protect me because, because the Ganef is going to steal from me. And then the attorney messes you over. Now you're upset with the Ganef. What do you want for the Ganef? The Ganef is a Ganef. Ganef will always steal. They always have and they always will. You can't expect anything different from a Ganef. The one who really let him down, the one who really deceived him, the one who really messed him over, seemingly is Rachel. He's, she's the one he should be upset with. I gave you, Yaakov should have come to Rachel and said, I gave you Simonim. The purpose of the Simonim was so that this doesn't happen. So that I don't end up marrying somebody else. Now, what do you do, Rachel? You violated my trust. You gave these simonim to someone else, to your own sister. Question number one. Let's ask question number two. Even more difficult to understand. What in heaven's name is going through Rachel's mind? (laughs) Rashi says, Rachel didn't want her older sister to get embarrassed. Rachel should have come to her older sister and said, listen, sweetheart, I love you dearly. You're my sister. Yaakov doesn't love you. He loves me. He doesn't want to marry you. He wants to marry me. We have a system in place, and this is not going to work. Rachel should have said to Leah, you don't want to get embarrassed? Don't go to the chuppah. You don't want to get embarrassed? You don't want Yaakov to look at you and say, what are you doing here? Don't go to the chuppah. He's not your husband. He's mine. If Rochel wants to spare Leah humiliation and shame, Rochel should have pulled her over quietly and said, listen, honey, this is not going to work. We have a system in play. We anticipated foul play beforehand, and we have protection, and it's not going to happen. Instead, what does she do? She violates the trust. She violates the trust of the man who loves her, Yaakov, and gives the simonim to Leah. And now Leah goes... Pretends she's somebody else. The next morning, Yaakov realizes his mistake. It's now not just Rochel who's duped him, but Leah too. (laughs) He's been duped by two women. Rochel deceived him and Leah deceived him. And what kind of a motive is this? She doesn't want, Rochel didn't want her older sister to be embarrassed. Therefore, what? Therefore, you allow your, your, the, the man who's planning to marry you to marry a different woman so somebody shouldn't get embarrassed? It seems like such a, such a difficult argument to accept. Now let's try to understand what's going through Leia's head. What's going on in Leia's mind? Imagine you marry a man. Imagine. Think about this from Leia's perspective. You marry a man who isn't interested in you. He wants to marry your sister. (laughs) He wants to marry your sister. No. Let's say Leia felt she wouldn't have better chances. All right, the Medrash says very famously that Leia was supposed to marry Asaph. That's why Leia, that's why Leia's eyes were soft and delicate. She was crying because, excuse me, she was crying because she didn't want to end up marrying Asaph. She was concerned. All right. Leia's motive perhaps was 
to get out of her destiny of marrying Esav. Okay, so she goes ahead and she goes along with this. She agrees to marry Yaakov. Okay. But what kind of a marriage is that? You marry a man. You know he wants to marry your sister. You know he's interested in your sister. You know he doesn't even know that he's marrying you. Then get this. In order to make sure that it's successful, what does Leah do? She accepts. She, Leah has to accept this. She accepts to be part of the scam and convince Yaakov that she, in fact, is her sister. And that's the story of their honeymoon night, where Yaakov thought that Leah was, her, was Rachel, because Leah went along with the plan and gave Yaakov the simonim that she got from Rachel. I, I'd like to ask you to think about this for a minute. How did Leah see this playing out? In other words, what was her plan the next morning when, when Yaakov looks at her and goes, whoops, you're not who I thought you were. What was Leah going to say? I'm so sorry to disappoint you. I'm so sorry I'm not my sister. But hey, guess what? I have this him on him. So, so that means that Lovon and Rachel and Leah are all in on it. Everybody's conspiring here all to trick Yaakov. How did Leah anticipate that this was going to end? It seems like she would have had a much better chance if she would have, you know, said to Yaakov, listen, Yaakov, um, we need to talk. <laughs> I'm Leah. I'm not Rachel. I know you love my sister, but I just want you to know my father is not going to give you Rachel until you marry me. Now, that may work. That may not work. But at least she would have been honest. That would seem like a much better way to start off a marriage. Now let me ask you another question. Rochel, of course, remains, remains the favorite wife of Yaakov. Leah, not so much. The Torah says, the Torah uses a very harsh word later on. The Torah describes the relationship, the emotional relationship between Yaakov and Leah as one of hate. Vayar Hashem kisnu Leah. Hashem saw that Leah was despised. Rochel, Yaakov loved. It doesn't seem anywhere that Yaakov at any point sat his two wives down and said, listen, sweethearts, don't ever do that to me again, ever. That's not okay. Nothing, no mention. The only one Yaakov's upset with is Lovan. As if you could expect anything else from Lovan. And now my favorite question. I think the best question of them all. Here it is. To this day, to this day, at every single chuppah and at every single wedding, there is a zecher, there is something that we do in memory of the fact that Lovan tricked Yaakov and gave him Leah rather than Rachel. There's something <laughs> that we do at every single wedding as an eternal memorial for this that Lovon tricked Yaakov and Yaakov thought he was marrying Rochel and he actually ended up marrying Leah. You know what it is? I'll tell you what it is. The minhag is, the custom is, that when the Chosen and Kala get married, the Kala's face is covered. She wears a veil. What's the reason? There are many reasons for it. One of the reasons, by the way, one of the many reasons why the Kala wears a veil is so that she shouldn't see People don't, don't necessarily know this. The Kala shouldn't see the ring that the Chosen is giving her. It's, one of the, it's not the only reason, but it's, it's one of the halachic reasons. The Kala shouldn't see the ring that the Chosen is giving her. When he gives her a ring and says, you're married to me with this ring. Why? What's the problem if the, if the Kala sees the ring? We're concerned that if she sees the ring, she's going to overestimate how much the ring is worth. She's going to look at the ring and go, ah, this ring, my husband loves me so much. It's probably worth $20,000. When in reality, maybe it's only worth 50. It's also the reason why we don't put diamonds on the ring, so that the Kala shouldn't overestimate the value of the ring. If she thinks the ring is worth more than it's actually worth, it's actually a Shail on the Kiddushin. 
because she only agreed to marry him for a $20,000 ring. In reality, the ring ends up being worth 50 bucks. So in order to, have, in order to, to, to save ourselves from any type of expectations, we, color, we cover the Kala's face. She doesn't see. All right, it's, 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 it's only one reason. There are many other reasons. It, it's symbolic of the idea that we want a couple to, to keep their expectations in check when they get married. All right, not for now. Be it as it may, the minag is, the minag is that the Kala's face is covered. Okay. At every single wedding, the minag is, I, I shouldn't say every, at many weddings, the custom is that the chosen himself is the one who covers the face of the kala. It's called bedeka. The chosen himself is the one who covers the face of the kala. Why? Why is the chosen? Who cares who covers the kala's face? Why does the chosen have to be the one to cover the kala? This is the reason. This is the reason. Because once upon a time, our great-grandfather Yaakov married a woman with a covered face. And he ended up marrying the wrong woman. Or he ended up marrying not the woman he thought he was marrying. The next morning he discovered it was someone else. So from now on, at every Jewish wedding, the chosen covers the kala's face. He makes sure it's the right one, and then he covers her, and then they get married. So that the chosen shouldn't wa- <laughs> so that the chosen shouldn't worry that his father-in-law is tricking him and giving him the woman's sister or giving him someone else. Rest assured, we tell the chosen. You see her, you identify her. She's the one. Now you cover. Now you, the chosen, cover her face. Now you can be assured, and then you take her to the chuppah. Now you can be assured that she is the one. From now on, for all eternity, whenever we cover a kala's face. It's in order for the chosen to make sure that he's marrying the right woman, not the wrong woman. This becomes hair-raising. Really? Does that seem like an appropriate way to react to this fiasco of marrying, of Yaakov marrying his, his, his beloved sister? If you were to ask me, I would say, you know what we do from now on? From now on, nobody gets married with a veil. No, nothing on the face of the chos, nothing, nothing on the face of the kala, so that when he actually puts the ring on her finger, when they actually stand under the chuppah together, he can look straight into her face and see if he's marrying the right woman. No, we keep the woman's face covered. Ah, you're concerned you married the wrong woman? Don't worry, you put the cover on her face. What kind of protection is that? And this is Minag Yisrael. Every couple who get married... Can we, we wish them they should be as happy as Odom and Chava began Eden Mikedem. And we told them this is how you do it. You, the Chosen, cover the Kala's face. And when you marry her, when you actually put the ring on her finger and marry her till death do us part, her face is covered. And we say the reason for this is because Yaakov thought he was marrying Rachel. And he ended up marrying Leah. Okay. And by the way, this story, Yaakov, Rochel, and Leah, it's our ans- these are our ancestors. This is where we come from. Our great great grandparents, this is the story. Yaakov, again, summarize Yaakov wasn't interested in Leah, he was interested in Rochel. Rochel gave the simonim to her older sister. Her older sister pretended she was the younger sister. Yaakov only discovered it the next morning. We don't find anywhere that Yaakov, Rochel, and Leah went to some form of therapy to talk about what it is that happened. <laughs> Nothing. The whole story gets shoved under the rug, at least as far as the Torah, the Chumash is concerned, never to be talked about or dealt with ever again. Yaakov remains completely in love with Rochel, even though she gave away the simonim. Leah walks into a marriage where, at least in the beginning, she's hated. The Torah doesn't say why she was hated, but presumably for pretending she was a younger sister. The only one Yaakov's upset with is Lavan, who did exactly, who did exactly what everybody knew he would do. And as a zecher, as a remembrance for this, this is what we do at every single wedding. We get married to a woman with her face covered. 
What's the Torah trying to teach us? Of the many beautiful insights that I've heard on this story, here's one which perhaps is more psychological of a more of a psychological insight or more of a an insight into human nature um, but one which which i think is is wise to study and reflect upon and definitely definitely one of the many many lessons that the torah is teaching us here i'll tell you what it is here's how i understand it rochel and leah are the same person again not literally but Metaphorically, Rochel and Leah are the same person, but they're perceived very differently. The same person, the same scenario, the same situations can be perceived very differently. What's the difference? Here it is. Rochel is the woman that Yaakov falls in love with. She's beautiful. She is everything he, he, he dreams of. Rachel is the woman that Yaakov sees. Literally, the Torah, the Torah actually literally says that the first time he saw her, the first time Yaakov sees Rachel, he has such a surge of energy that he lifts the rock off the mouth of the well, something that usually took all the local shepherds to do. Yaakov does it himself. Yaakov, uh, Rachel is the woman that Yaakov falls in love with. Rachel is the woman that Yaakov perceives as being perfect. Rachel is the woman every man falls in love with. Rachel is the woman in Yaakov's imagination. Again, not literally. Literally, Rachel, was, of course, was a real human being. But my point, the, the lesson I think that the, the wisdom here that Torah is trying to tell us is, Rochel is a woman that Yaakov sees, that a young man sees, and falls in love with her. This is everything that he has imagined and dreamed of. She's perfect. She doesn't hassle him. She doesn't harass him. She makes him feel good about himself. She is the woman of his dreams. Her name is Rochel. Every man thinks he's marrying a Rochel. And every woman and every man wakes up the next morning with a different woman than the woman he's married. Because something called reality hits. And when reality hits, and when we actually get married, we make some fascinating discoveries. We make some, some discoveries about our spouse. We make some discoveries about ourselves. We make some discoveries about the world. And at Sada Shava Shebohem, the common denominator with all of these discoveries is that they're not what we anticipated. Surprise. Surprise. Surprise, your spouse has issues. Surprise, you have issues. Surprise, things are not going to be as you anticipated. Surprise, the woman you wake up with is, so to speak, not the woman you went to sleep with the night before. Reality happened. Reality happens. And it catches people off guard. And they make a discovery that's disappointing to them. <sighs> I thought I was getting this, I was getting that. You see, Hashem made us all in such a way where we can be and should be idealistic at times. We think, ah, our marriage is going to be like this. Our, you know, we're going to go into a particular career. It's going to be like this. We have certain expectations. And life as it happens never happens the way we anticipate it. Never. It's the way Hashem made the world. The reality as it unfolds is always different than the picture we had in our minds before we entered into it. 
and people get disappointed. Okay. People get disappointed. What happens next? What happens next is the most important part of this whole discussion. What does happen next? Let's go back to the story just for a minute. What happens next is that Leah has children. One, two, three, four. Rochel remains barren. And the woman that Yaakov worked for, the woman that Yaakov had anticipated, the woman he was after, is, so to speak, giving him nothing. As far as children are concerned. The woman he was never interested in in the first place. She's the one bearing him children. In the end, Leah has six sons. Yaakov will marry another two women, Bilo and Zilpah, combined, all of them together will give him another six, each one two. Leah gives him six children on her own. The woman that Yaakov was not interested in, the woman that, that, that he went in, went, the, the woman that, he, he, that he, was, he overlooked because he wanted her younger sister, she's the one who gives him half of the Shvatim come from Leah, not Rochel. Rochel only two. And even those two, Rochel struggles with. The maidservants give two each. Rochel herself, only two. What's the, what's the Torah trying to tell us? The Torah, on many levels, the Torah is trying to tell us, reality as it unfolds will never be the reality that you expected. In many ways, it'll be much better. In many ways, it'll be deeper. In many ways, it'll be much more fulfilling. It'll give you much more children. But it's going to require you, the one who invested in this, to change your mind, to change your perception, to change what it is that you're after, and to wake up to a reality different than the one you expected. I think, at least on, on one level, that's, what the, that's one of the many things the Torah is telling us here. The Torah is telling us, look, Yaakov could have woken up the next morning and he could have been mad at the world. I wanted Rochel, I got Leah. He could have been upset with Rochel, he could have been upset with Leah, he could have been. You know, Lovan says to him, we don't give, Lovan's excuse for this is, we don't give the older daughter before the younger daughter. That's Lovan's explanation. We don't give the older daughter, we don't give the younger daughter before the older daughter. Lovan tells him, work for another seven years. Yaakov just accepts it. Yaakov just accepts it. He doesn't divorce Leah. He accepts it. Seven days later, he marries Rochel. He works for another, he works for another seven years. Apparently, Yaakov understood that there were forces at play here that were larger than even he himself had anticipated. So let me say this, let me say it in, in stronger and clearer words, what I think the Torah is saying. What I think the Torah is saying is like this. We all go into life. We all go into experiences. We all go into projects with a certain perception, with a certain understanding, with a certain picture in our heads of what it is that we're going in for, what it is that we're going to do. At some point, that expectation, that perception needs to be torn up and a deeper, higher, and greater reality needs to emerge, a more complicated one. You see, we want things to be simple. We want things to go as planned. We want things to go in the way that we want them to go. Hashem says, what if I have bigger and greater and deeper things in store for you? Are you ready to let go of the mindset you had until now in order to embrace something bigger? Are you ready to accept that your perception until this point was limited? Are you ready to accept that your perception of marriage was limited? Are you ready to face challenges and grow in your marriage, in your career, in your avoid us Hashem and emerge into something greater and higher? Are you ready to settle? 
Are you ready, not settle, chas v'shalom. Are you ready to settle into a higher reality which you didn't anticipate before? If yes, you'll have children, you'll have 12 shvatim in ways that you didn't see coming. Or are you going to insist that the perception, that the ideas, that the way you imagined it until now, that that's the way it needs to be and it cannot change? Are you going to hold on to the way you thought, the way you saw the world yesterday? Are you going to insist that you were right for having certain expectations? Are you going to, to, to dig your heels in the sand and say, this is not what I bought into, I wanted something else? And not truly embrace what is in front of you? What if what is in front of you is greater? What then? Are you going to insist that you have what it is that you wanted from the beginning? Or are you going to do as Yaakov did? You wake up in the morning, you discover that it's Leah, you get thrown off. You get thrown off. It's not what I expected, not what I anticipated, nothing like that. Okay. Hashem must have a bigger and a greater plan. And Yaakov embraces it. Now think about this just for a minute. In the end, in the end, Yaakov is buried next to Leah, not Rachel. Rachel, the Torah says, is buried somewhere on the road. Rachel has been cave of Rachel. Yes, so that the children, that later the Eden would come and daven there, granted. Rachel, so to speak, dies on the way. Destiny, in the end, Yaakov is buried next to Leah. What does that mean? Again, on a spiritual, metaphorical level, what it means is that these two women, Rochel and Leah, Rochel, the one he thinks he's going to marry, Rochel, the anticipation, the one he expects, the one, the picture, the way he has it in his mind before he gets into it. That woman, so to speak, dies on the road. On the road, in the process of embracing his identity, in the process of becoming Yaakov Avinu, the father of the Jewish people, somewhere along the road, the rochels, the perceptions that we had going into this, are buried. And a deeper and a higher and a greater reality emerge. And it's Leah. And Leah is the woman he's buried with. I often have the opportunity to study with young men who are going to be getting married. They are chasanim. They're engaged. They're going to be getting married. And we sit and we have conversations about all sorts of things, things they need to know in preparation for marriage, things they need to know in preparation for life, things they need to know, et cetera, et cetera. And very often they give me that really, really convinced, naive look, you know, they look at me and they say, they tell me my marriage is going to be different. We're never going to fight. We're never going to have difficult days in our marriage. We're going to communicate, right? We're never going to go to sleep angry. You know that piece of wisdom? Don't go to sleep angry, stay up and fight. We're never going to go to sleep angry. We're going to, we're going to work through all our issues. We've talked about it. We're on the same page. Our marriage is going to be different. We're not going to struggle the way other people struggle in their marriages. And in a moment of honesty, I'll sometimes say to the young men, the young man, I bless you that you're terribly wrong. I bless you that what you just said is not your destiny. I bless you that you do have difficult days in your marriage. I bless you that you do struggle. I bless you that at times you do disagree with your wife. And I bless you that every struggle and every difficult day and every moment of doubt and weakness brings you closer together and makes you stronger. I bless you that this well-intentioned but childish perspective that you carry today, I bless you that it falls away. Bury it somewhere along the road. 
I promise you better things are in store, but you need to grow up. You need to grow up and you need to learn that life can be disappointing at times and that's okay. You need to learn that marriage can be disappointing at times and that's okay. You need to learn that in your own service of Hashem, you'll experience setbacks along the way. And not only is that okay, but you can grow to places through it and because of it that you would never otherwise get to. I bless you that you and your spouse do feel comfortable with each other to sometimes express differences of opinion in no uncertain terms. And I bless you that that bring you, to, bring you closer together too. I bless you that you grow out of your childish or, or, or naive or inexperienced perception of what marriage is and discover that there is greater and deeper depth. I bless you that you not be scared to experience difficult and pain and hardship in life. I bless you that you have the stamina to go through it and emerge bigger and stronger. I bless you with the skills to know what to do in these types of scenarios. And I bless you not just with a marriage that will be held together, but I bless you with a marriage that has a quality of a relationship that the way Hashem made the world can only be experienced through moments of difficulty. And that I think at least on one level is what the Torah is trying to tell us here. Yaakov went to sleep with Rachel and woke up with Leah. He had, he had anticipated one woman, discovered another. He thought he was going into one type of relationship. He ended up in another. But that's not the story. That's not where the story ends. The story ends that although him and Leah had difficult moments, they remained together. 50% of their children were born from that. And in the end, in the end, that's the woman he remains married to. That's the woman he, he, he remains buried next to forever. Or, or perhaps on a spiritual level, we'd say in the end, Rochel and Leah become one, where the woman he's married to is not just everything he anticipated, but it is even more. All right, granted, it's a bit of a metaphorical explanation, but, but this is the way, it, it's one perspective. Why does Rochel give Leah the simonim? Why does Rochel give her older sister Leah the simonim? Because Rochel can tell that there's more to them. The Rochel can tell that we have to bring Leah into this unity. We have to bring Leah into this marriage. We have to make place. Again, Rochel is the expectation. Leah is the reality. Rochel has the wisdom. She understands that if we block out reality from our marriage, it's never going to work. The marriage is going to be a shameful one, so to speak. Leah needs, to be, Leah needs to be welcomed into this marriage. We have to be able to fail. We have to be able to have difficult days in the marriage and we have to be okay with it. So Rochel gives the simonim to her older sister and her older sister takes it. Yes. Reality has its place. Reality is not intended to do away with expectations, to do away with hopes and dreams. Reality is there to help guide us. Why is Yaakov not upset with either of them? Not Rachel or Leah. Why is Yaakov not upset with Rachel or Leah? Because when Yaakov wakes up the next morning and discovers what has happened, Yaakov understands the lesson. He learns it. Yaakov learns that there is something more here to grow into, that there is more to unpack, that there's more to marriage than even he himself had anticipated. And he's ready to learn that from his wives. Why do we cover the face of every Kala who gets married to her husband? Why? From that day on, you know, there's a Persian custom or a Svarta custom that at a wedding they go, they actually, one of the chants that people call out is li li li. They'll go li 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 li. Apparently, the origin of that is they were trying to warn Yaakov that it's Leah. They were saying Leah, 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 Leah. Why do we cover the face of every kala when the chosan and kala stand under the wedding? Well, what are we trying to tell them? You don't know who you're marrying? You shouldn't know who you're marrying? No. What we're really telling them is this marriage has stuff in it 
that you yourselves don't yet know about. We're trying to tell them there's beauty and there's quality and there's a closeness of relationship that the two of you can, can grow into that today you're unaware of. There's stuff in each other that you don't know. You'll make discoveries. Some of them you'll like, some of them you won't like. We want you to marry a woman whose face you can't see. We want you to look at a veil and say, Arayat Mukodeshisli, in which case you're committed not to make the marriage work with the perception as you see it, but to make the marriage work with that which goes even beyond what you can perceive. Commit, commit to making this work. Invest yourself, promise yourselves and each other that you'll work. And when your expectations, when the picture you have in your mind falls apart, that you'll let go of that. Because you trust in Hashem and you trust each other that a deeper and a greater reality will emerge. And you'll walk into that slowly but surely. But please God, together, as Yaakov and Rochel and Leah did, you'll build all of Klal Yisrael. You know, my friends, in today's day and age, nobody wants to fix anything. We live in what they're calling a disposable generation. Nobody wants to fix anything. Something breaks, poof, out it goes. A phone breaks, it's in the garbage. A car breaks, it's in the garbage. Something tears, boom, 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 because we can get things new, right? So easy, often cheaper, right? Cheaper to get a new phone than to fix your old phone. Cheaper to get a new car than to fix your old car. Just toss it out and move on, disposable. Everything is disposable. You know what's not disposable? Relationships the quality of human relationships, not disposable. You want a good marriage? You want to be a good parent? You want to have 12, 12 Shvatim who will be the ancestors of Klal Yisrael? You want to produce a Jewish nation who will be there eternally? There are going to be surprises along the way. You're going to have to embrace a bracha given to you by the Rabbi Nishlelem that's more than you can possibly understand. It's going to catch you off guard. And you're going to have to go through the painful process of shedding, of losing your own shell, of, of, of climbing out of your own limited perspective. Rochel was the perspective Yaakov was locked in. He loved her. He loved her from the first moment he saw her. He thought he would marry her and everything would be fantastic. <laughs> never a bad day, never a headache. Nothing. Low maintenance. Rachel said to him, are you kidding? That's not how marriage works. You want to know what marriage is? Marriage is Leah and Rachel. Marriage is reality and hopes and dreams. Marriage is a mortgage and dishes and bills and difficult days and good days. Marriage is the ability to embrace reality and grow every day one step higher and deeper. Marriage is the ability to say, I didn't realize, I had no idea. When I, when I started, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I'm learning new things each day. Marriage requires a person to be open, to, to have an open perspective and discover, to say, to say I was wrong, to have the humility to grow out of what I perceived and to climb it to something higher and to do it again and again. And this gift is the gift given to Yaakov by both Rochel and Leah together. May Hashem bless us that as ya to learn from Yaakov, as Yaakov did, when we wake, as we wake up in the morning each day and discover things we don't recognize, instead of getting bitter and resentful and angry, instead of kicking and screaming and looking to toss it out, and, you know, that we understand that Hashem has given us an opportunity here to climb into something higher and deeper, that we have the humility to shed our shells, the shells in our own minds, the limit, and the things that hold us back and produ produce true offspring, produce families, produce children, physical and or spiritual, 
who can produce Klal Yisrael, who can give us the Jewish people, who can give us a Jewish nation, who can get, think about what the Jewish people have been through. Think about what the Jewish people have been through over the course of their, of the course of their existence. You know, I was reading, I'm out of time. I was reading when the Beis HaMikdash, when the second Beis HaMikdash was destroyed, the rabbis were, were concerned about what happened with Yiddishkeit. And yet again and again, the Jewish people were able to, to stay connected to Hashem and to find the meaning in this over and over again. May Hashem bless us that we learn from Yaakov and Rochel and Leah. Let's remember that Hashem has bigger brachas in store for us than we can ever imagine. Let's not limit ourselves. Let's not keep ourselves limited in terms of what it is that we can absorb. Hashem has bigger brachas for us than we are even, than we perceive ourselves to be capable of absorbing. Yes, we need to grow and make ourselves bigger and let go of our expectations of the past in order to absorb even bigger brachas from Hashem in the future. Have a wonderful Shabbos.